Listen, listen to me. Listen, listen, brother. Please, please listen. I listen to you. I'm going to answer your question. And I am answering it. Life. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm answering your question. Thank you, thank you, caller. Um, Rev, would you like to take a couple of questions? Yes, of course. But I'm not here to argue okay, with people. And if we united, we would not be subjected to the things that we are subjected to today because of our disunity. Think of what has happened to us. How many of you are Christian? Practically the whole island. But Christ was not divided. So if you are divided into all of these denominations and one denomination thinking I'm better than the other, then there is no division, uh, no unity. We're divided light against dark, educated against non-educated, privileged against non-privileged, rich against poor. So all of these are mechanisms of white supremacy that disallow us to develop that most powerful of weapons, our unity. So once we unite, the Caribbean can become one of the powerful nations in the world. If you look at what is under our feet, the riches of our mineral strength, the riches of our ability to provide agricultural products to the world, we have it all under our feet, but what is under our feet is gradually being taken from us through our loaning, taking money from the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the IDB. They will build you an airport. They will build your seaport. They will give you an electrical grid. At what price? And at the end of the day, when you have to de devalue your dollar and then sell things at a higher price where the indigenous uh, Antiguans and Barbudans have to pay, pay, pay. And believe me, the people are hurting. Our unity in the Caribbean will resolve that. And instead of going, if you go to the supermarket, get the butter. Where is it from? It's from New Zealand. It's from Australia. This is from England. The other is from America. What is it saying? That we are still feeding the economies of those that subjugated us. These, these islands yes. built London, Manchester, Paris, these islands built Brussels, these islands built Amsterdam, these islands built Europe into an economic power. In fact about it, France was making so much money from the sugar industry that when Dessalines and Toussaint, Louverture and others gained their freedom, France literally caused Haiti to pay reparations to France for their loss of their slaves. Think about the wickedness of such people. No wonder our great prime minister, when he went before the United Nations, commanded the respect of the nations by demanding reparations from all of these European bloodsuckers of the islands of the Caribbean and the people of the Caribbean so that today we have to make a way for them. The IDB, the World Bank, will tell petitions, oh, you don't have, well, you're not, you know, you're not, you're defaulting on your debt, but what you can do is sell some of your land. Who are you going to sell it to? The little man can't buy it, so the people come down from North America, from London, from England, from other places, buying up the best parcels of land, and then instead of set, setting up farms so you could feed yourself, they set up golf course. You don't play no golf, so they bring people down to play golf, you become the caddy. They open up all these resorts, you become the bed uh, maker, the cook, the maid. Is that what we are born for? Come. I don't think so. I want to see all you tomorrow night. We're going to talk about these things. 
we got to do something and above all we got to show love for self love for god love for our neighbor and come together to solve our problems good morning can i help you yeah hey, good morning Nat. go right ahead i would like to ask the good gentleman a question first i would like to mention what saint paul said mr farrakhan yes sir saint paul said and put political authority is god servant to do good and agent of justice government is not the end of itself but is to be a servant to bring a greater peace and justice for the good to humanity you know that yes sir i do this question i want to put to you i heard you mention the prime minister gave you a nice car and pin how would you describe the prime minister the honorable Baldwin Spencer to tell the nation to chop up people and it's all right you to do what and chop up people and nothing wrong with that how would you describe that well i that yes happened? let me say this you know the bible teaches you also that satan deceived no, listen listen to me listen listen brother please Please listen. I listen to you. But I'm going to answer your question and I am answering it. You said that political powers is not an end of itself. Correct. But pol politicians must work for the greater good to bring justice in the earth. Correct. So tell me why is there so much injustice in the earth if the politicians have done what you said Paul said they should do they have not done it because they have been deceived and conquered by satan and that's why the scripture tells you put on the whole armor of god that you may be able to stand against the wiles of satan now if your prime minister told you to chop off people head and hand i didn't hear that but i know this moses was a liberator no, no. and moses told them an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and when peter when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus and Peter took out a sword and chop off the man's ear Jesus told Peter sheathe your sword for those who live by the sword will die by that same sword and these war mongers that called themselves politicians have put the earth in a position that the great war of Armageddon is about to take place in fact it has already started and that's why America has come into the Caribbean you have a general for the eastern caribbean and an american general for the western caribbean and they're taken people that used to walk the street with a little uh, stick as a bobby like the british now they're armed with um bulletproof vest machine gun sawed off shotgun tasers pepper spray so we are not dealing listen to me we're not dealing with people now that god sent him to rule you know that send who to rule king governor god placed them to manage us are they doing it that is why i'm asking if he think he's right to say well i see he is, he like you he like us are victims of the world but he's supposed to say sorry moses oh, said i for an eye oh. tooth for a tooth and a life for a life I'm from my question. oh no i'm not yeah, i'm answering your that. question thank you thank you caller um rev would you like to take another couple of other questions Would yes of course no, but i'm not here to argue okay, okay, with people enough, yes um you did mention um earlier the trevon yeah, martin situation and of course, it's very sad okay. to those of us, um, you know, what has um, transpired here in um, Florida, I think it is. Um, from your perspective as the Nation of Islam, um, will there be anything that you'll be doing to assist the family? Um, Sharpton went down and had this big march, and others had the, um, the hoodie march in um, New York. 
Um, is there anything that um, your organization plan to do as far as um, supporting the family? I spoke to the mother and the father, but by telephone, because uh, they were to meet me when I was in Miami, but they were so busy uh, with so many people asking them for interviews that unfortunately I didn't have the privilege of meeting them personally, but we met by phone, and I spoke to her. I'm not going into the conversation that I had with her, but what is there for us to do but continue to awaken our people to the cry for justice? The new Black Panther Party said, we're going to put out a warrant for citizens of rest for Zimmerman. Now, I don't know about um, my brother who called. You know, he wants me to knock down the prime minister because of what the prime minister may have said. But I wonder, do you have the same spirit to knock down those white people who brought our fathers into slavery and robbed you and me of name, language, culture, religion, God, and turned you inside out as a human being where we are the most non-productive of people. Would you knock the governments that did that to you? Now, you want to knock your prime minister who want to chop off a head. I didn't hear him say that, but... I'm not going to argue with that because one day when people rob, when people kill, when people rape and people destroy other people, the law that is the law of God is that a life should be taken for a life. I don't see no way that we should put people in prison and keep on feeding them, feeding them with the taxpayer's dollar when they have committed heinous crimes. However, God in his mercy says that all of us can be redeemed. All of us can be reconciled again to God. But if we fail to reconcile, then what? I close for my brother that called and for all of you that listen. If you are expecting the return of Jesus Christ, and you are, then the scripture says when he returns, he's not coming back to preach. He comes back with a sword in his hand and the sword is dripping with blood and it must be the blood of the wicked and the blood of the unjust and the blood of rulers who rule with injustice and I hope that you and I will be alive on the return of Christ and are on the right side of his sword. I just want to ask it as a formality and to get it out of the way because I don't want to entertain you to such questions anymore. Are you racist and are you anti-Semitic? I'm coming to you too, Momza Mandela, with that question. And I'll tell you why I'll motivate later on in the show. No, I don't consider myself either a racist or an anti-Semite. To be a racist, one would have to have an inordinate love of self, but to put others at a disadvantage for the advantage of self. Now, when a person plays a violin and they play it well, they're called a violinist. When a person uh, is an artist and does their art well, they call them an artist. And when one is a chemist or a physicist or a biologist, the I-S-T on the end of that word means they are completely dedicated, committed, and proficient in that science or that art. To call me a racist would mean that I am dedicated to the uplift of my people, which I am, but not to the point where I would deprive another human being of their God-given right of freedom, justice, and equality. I definitely am not anti-Semitic. I do not hate Jewish people. 
I have great respect and admiration for them, but I am critical of aspects of their behavior in the relationship between blacks and Jews. And because of their sensitivity, having suffered so much in so many different countries under so many different kinds of leaders, they are very sensitive to criticism. And when you criticize, they take that to mean you are anti-Semitic. You seemed to say, uh, Minister Farrakhan, that uh, there is a relationship between crime and poverty, and it doesn't seem like the two were being adequately addressed in South Africa to your observation. First, I, I would like to say that politics without economics is symbol without substance. And although Mrs. Mandela promised the people legitimate promises and the ANC made these promises. They made these promises because promises were made to the ANC that if a peaceful transition could be met, there would be benefits. Unfortunately, these benefits never came. So now what is happening is little by little the joy of the South African people over the election of their first black president is gradually being eroded. No one can tell me that the police force in Johannesburg is incapable of stopping crime in the downtown section of Johannesburg. I would not believe that. Now, if you look at the crime, and you look at the fact that this crime did not exist in the numbers in which it exists now, prior to the advent of a black government, then what is the underlying message that is being sent here? First of all, uh, I would like to uh, come to what Mrs. Mandela was saying you see, when you have a truth and reconciliation commission, but there is no atonement for criminal acts against a people, even if punishment is not levied against the individual, the price should be some act of atonement to repair the damage that hundreds of years of injustice have inflicted on the masses of the people. So if you have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, people who have been horrendous in their deprivation of human rights of the blacks of South Africa can say, I'm sorry, and get away with it, what we are not seeing as we create an atmosphere where the whites would not feel that the blacks coming into power would uh, wreak vengeance on them. But under that, you're sending another message that you can commit horrible crimes and just say you're sorry, and it is all forgiven. So surely the man that is a mugger or a thief in the street or even a murderer well, maybe I can get away with this if those who have committed larger crimes can come before a commission and confess and get away with it. Well, so in a sense, you are undermining the very principle upon which jurisprudence is based. But even the leader of uh, that group of people, let alone coming to the commission to say he's sorry, he's even refusing to do that. And one here is talking of one P.W. Botte, is basically saying uh, to Archbishop Tutu and his commission, go, go jump. Well, it is unfortunate that what you have, <clears throat> from what I'm able to see, is poverty 
that had hope in it because of the emergence of the ANC and President Mandela. And now that hope is diminishing and growing into despair. I came here two years ago, and as I got off the plane, a black man met me at the plane wrapped in chains. When I got to the hotel, he was there wrapped in chains mm -hmm. and he was miles he was telling me things have not changed Farrakhan we are still in chains and what I respectfully suggest to the whites of this nation who have been privileged who have wealth and real economic power unless the suffering of the masses is eased then this is going to degenerate into something that could render South Africa, like Liberia or other countries in Africa that suffered from civil war. The last point I want to make is, I have noticed in the United States of America that at a certain point we were happy to elect a black candidate. But under the black candidate, our hopes were elevated. We thought we were really going to see dramatic change. But having a black man in a position of political power, while the economics of the city is controlled by others, meant that that black man could not deliver on his promise to black people. So now, in many of the cities that have had black mayors, there are whites coming up now being reelected. Gary, Indiana, is a city that had one of our first black mayors, Mayor Hatcher. And when he became mayor in this steel-producing city, the whites said, we will never submit to a black mayor. They moved out of the city closed their businesses, moved to the suburbs, built the suburbs into a paradise, and left Gary as a predominantly black city that died. And after years of a black mayor, they finally said, forget it. And they voted for a white mayor. And now that white mayor is able to bring back to the city needed funds to make the city live again. Could that be what is happening here in South Africa? Give you the freedom to elect a black man. The ANC is now in political power, but not in economic power to really fulfill their promises without a close alliance with the white business community and the white business community fulfilling their promises. After a while, the crime increases, the violence increases, and the suggestion is it was better under both of them than under Mandela. And after a while, the nationalists will come back and say, you will do better under us. And there's the end of your political power. It is all right back in the hands of those that you thought you took power from, but all you did was become the manager of a white reality, and therefore you must manage it according to the way they see that you manage it, because you own nothing. We have got to change that equation in order for South Africa to live up to her great potential. Still think that we are slaves still think that we are on a plantation and that we have to get white approval and permission before we act as free men. And what we want to do is to serve notice on the Albrights and the Clintons of the United States and of the world. That never, never again will we allow anyone to tell us who our friends are when you have been our worst enemy and we are trying now for reconciliation with you. 
So if we can reconcile with people who hung us, burned us, shot us, deprived us, why can't we have friendship with those who have never done these things to us? And if we have friendship with them, keep your mouth out of it. You have nothing to do with who we befriend since you have never been our friend yourself. Minister Louis Farrakhan. I object to an outsider calling up we an outsider off the radio calling up we in this country. He doesn't know what any of the we went through. We being you and other people like you. I object to him being on the radio. You are love. I am why? <laughs> why must you say we? No, no, I'm saying why. Leah is John here. You say you abhor Minister Farrakhan being on the radio, being in South Africa. Be, he's not. He's not one of us. Now I may ask if you say you object to him saying we, and then you say he is not. Okay, give me a chance. Give me a chance, Leah. No, no, wait a minute. No, we're not fighting. I need to ask you a question. I gave you a chance to state your case. Now, I need just to clear one thing before Winnie Mandela responds. Yeah. Oh, okay, can, can you give me a chance now? You say you object to him saying we because he is not one of what you call us. Now, you say us. By us, who exactly do you mean? I see. And and may you, I respond? You say Minister Farrakhan is not an African. May I may I please yes, respond? Please. Oh, oh, okay. My, um, may I? Oh, 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 oh. To talk to us. oh, all right, Leanne. I'll put you on hold. I haven't cut you off because you won't allow us to come in. So let's give him a chance to respond. Perhaps later this year, President Clinton will visit South Africa. And maybe President Clinton, as an outsider, might give some counsel or advice to move the economy forward, to lessen the tension in the society, and identify with the problems of South Africa, since America has similar racial problems. And in identifying with suffering, you can say we, if you are a woman and you had a baby, and I were a woman and I had a baby in America, and I identified with the pain of your childbirth because I understood that pain, I'm very qualified to say we. John Fitzgerald Kennedy stood in Berlin and said these words, Ich bin ein Berliner. He identified with Berlin because of the separation of a wall that divided them he wanted to identify with those people of Berlin he's applauded for that now my dear you are an African how long where did you come from did you come ah 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 Madam, but you said Madam, so. but you said so, Lee. You said Madam we in identifying with Winnie Mandela. But can you answer? Well, well, Miss, I come. I think I, we, are, we are bringing the standard of the debate much much lower but i i, I would so, like to yeah. to respond mm -hmm. because in the united states of america 
we had our own system of apartheid called Jim Crow. And we couldn't go into this place or that place. We couldn't go to toilet in certain areas. We couldn't be buried in a, the same burial ground with whites. We saw our people lynched and burned at the stake. So when I say we to Winnie Mandela and to the blacks of South Africa, I say we because I am an African. I didn't choose to go to America. I was forcibly kidnapped from Africa and brought to America. You and your parents decided to come to Africa and now you have adopted Africa as your home. I never left Africa as a home and even though I live in America, I identify with the suffering of my people in Africa. So I'm more qualified, my dear, to say we to Winnie than you are because you yourself have never suffered like Winnie. You have never been in the townships living like Winnie and her people did. She already told you in her talk about housing that you never lived under the circumstances that the blacks in the shanty towns live under. So when you say we South Africans, who are you talking about? Minister Louis Farrakhan, and he is the leader of the Nation of Islam today. Well, I'm glad you said that, uh, Minister Farrakhan, because in fact, I resided in the United States for 20 years, and so some of the experience you speak about being sort of a, an outsider, I certainly had that. Uh, but one of the things you said that was crucial is that uh, West Indians have provided a great example in terms of being an empowered people to uh, particularly black Americans and people throughout the globe. So one of the things I wanted to find out is, uh, obviously you're here for a forum on the power of Caribbean unity and black economics. And uh, you know, the thought came to mind, why is it that we need this sort of uh, revival or reminder at this time as a, as a country, as a region, who has provided such inspiration to the rest of the world? That's a beautiful question. We in America have gained so much from the presence of Marcus Musaya Gavi, Edward Blyden, um, from Padmore, C.L.R. James. All of these men inspired us. And of course, Mr. Gavi inspired Kwame Nkrumah, so when you go to Ghana, you see Black Star Square, and the Black Star is in the flag of the Ghanaian people as a tribute to Marcus Musaya Gavi. And when I was in Ghana, I visited the grave of Padmore, who is there in Ghana, as well as W.E.B. Du Bois, and laid flowers at their graves because we wouldn't be who we are and where we are if these lions did not roar in the jungle of America to stir young lions to come up again. But here's a problem. Since we had so-called independence, if you remember economically, the Caribbean gave more to Europe, gave more to Great Britain than all of her colonies outside of England because of the sugar industry, banana, tobacco, and molasses and rum. Well, we've given so much to them, but when we became independent, excuse me, we became independent because they said it's time. Not that we weren't ready, but when somebody gives you freedom, you didn't fight for it. You didn't evolve necessarily to achieve it, but Britain decided it was better to free you 
because you were reaching for it and then tried to control you in another way. So all of our great liberating um, personalities, we had a sugar industry, it's gone. We had a banana industry, it's gone. Yet sugar and banana helped to make England rich. We had tobacco, gone. What happened to all the industries that made Europe what Europe became economically and the moment we become independent, those industries were tactically, strategically destroyed. There was a Jewish gentleman, I can't remember his name, from the United States. He went into Costa Rica and bought up three million acres of land and became the master of the United Fruit Company. So when we are independent, we wanted to give our bananas, sell our bananas to Europe, our sugar to Europe. But then they crippled the banana industry, crippled the sugar industry, sugar gone, banana gone, in this most industry gone. And so we now, economically, are more service-oriented than we are developing industry in the West Indies to give our children who are being educated in these universities a place to practice what they've learned so when we get the tertiary, tertiary education, we leave the West Indies and give the benefit of our knowledge to Europe and America. And so today, the West Indies is not as strong as we could be. And it's going to take not only the unity of CARICOM, but it's going to take the maturity of our political leaders to see, as I heard Reverend Jackson say, it is better to be the tail of something than the head of nothing. And if all of us would come together, the Caribbean is so rich and so potentially strong that no citizen of the Caribbean would not have a decent quality of life if we had the political maturity to become a mighty Caribbean nation rather than all of these small islands which are being picked off by the IDB, the World Bank, and the IMF. Now, you obviously have had a, a lot of input and have had time over... Um, an extended period of time to kind of assess some of the political environments in the Caribbean. In fact, I know that you did your Caribbean tour last year in Jamaica, Haiti, and uh, St. Kitts, and you started off your Caribbean tour in December of this year. Um, obviously, you also have uh, representatives in this area, David Mohammed, uh, Khalil Shabazz. What sort of uh, gaps do you see existent in that political maturity you speak of that needs to be achieved to uh, create that economic uh, sustainability that we need? When I was in Jamaica, I had the privilege of talking with Mr. Edward Siaga and Mr. P.J. Patterson, former prime ministers. I questioned them about the political unity of the Caribbean. Mr. Edward Siaga said he didn't think it would ever happen. Mr. P.J. Patterson thought maybe in the future. I talked to Dudley Thompson. I don't know whether you've heard of Dudley Thompson. He was a brilliant jurist, Pan-Africanist. He's the lawyer that freed Jomo Kenyatta. Before he passed away, I asked him about the bauxite industry that um, Michael Manley nationalized, Burnham nationalized. I said, why didn't we take our bauxite and turn it into aluminum rather than sending it to America and Europe, they turn our bauxite into aluminum and send it back to us. He said, well, we had a problem with energy. 
We had the bauxite, but we didn't have the energy. The energy was in Trinidad, but we couldn't get the kind of cooperation economically with Trinidad so that Trinidad could supply Jamaica with um, energy that could have taken the bauxite from Burnham to Jamaica and then turn it into aluminum, send it back to America at a price that could strengthen us economically. But that is an issue that occurs right there in the U.S. among large enterprises, but we'll have more discussion on that after the break. Right. But coming back to the Caribbean, yes, please, you know, um, when I said that bauxite could have been uh, made into um, aluminum here, what is happening in the Caribbean is we're losing farming, agriculture. Most of the islands are very rich in terms of the land to be able to farm. But what I'm finding is that we have more food coming in from the outside to satisfy our needs than what we're growing in the Caribbean to satisfy needs. And uh, tomorrow night, God willing, I want to show us with the help of God how we are being gradually killed through food, through AIDS, through the things that are weakening us as a healthy, strong people. And b because you have your mouth in the kitchen of your former colonial master, and now they're coming into Jamaica and the Caribbean with all these but we are not checking to see is it really what you're what you're telling me is it it is or are you infecting us with something that will limit our lifespan on this earth so you can take the caribbean again as your possession and we are left here as the servants of our, our european and american masters and our women used to give pleasure to the degeneracy of the culture of America. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because recently in our studio we had the Minister of Agriculture, Sir Hilston uh, Baptiste, Baptist, uh, with some of his uh, technical staff. And obviously Antigua is uh, very heavily concentrated on uh, giving uh, more vibrance and resurgence to its agricultural industry. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, one of the things we have discussed recently uh, is the need to focus more intensely on moving agriculture from the uh, uh, primary to the secondary stage where we can actually have value-added products, etc. So, this leads me to the question. Um, have you had, I know you just arrived on island, but have you had or do you have intentions to meet with uh, these key stakeholders during your visit on island? I met with um, Prime Minister this morning and I asked if I could meet with the Minister of Agriculture. Unfortunately, he's out of the country right now, but we talked about agriculture and I was very proud of what he said that uh, uh, Antigua was doing agriculturally. The Chinese have been very helpful I, I saw the new medical uh, uh, school and uh, medical institution that they built, and I asked him, uh, I was talking with one of the policemen that uh, has been shepherding me since I've been here, and I saw land as we were traveling, and I said, this land looked like it could be turned into agriculture. He said, yes, but we don't have sufficient water. So I asked about the aquifer system, and I asked about desalination, and I found that the, desalin the desalination uh, uh, is, is, is low. It is not as up-to-date as it could be, and the aquifer system. So I asked if he would ask the Chinese if they're helping, help us with this by upgrading the desalination plant and upgrading the aquifer system so that little people in uh, Antigua could look at their land and start 
creating food and agriculture so that we can supply the hotels and we can supply our own people with a lot of their food needs without bringing food from so far away that has been salted and chemically treated so that it looks good in the supermarket, but we are the ones that are suffering from high blood pressure, diabetes, all forms of cancer, and an AIDS pandemic that is sweeping Africa, Black America, and the Caribbean. Well, food sovereignty throughout the globe is crucial. And As I have studied what these islands produce, our unity would allow us to take the richness of our mineral strength and the products that we produce agriculturally to lift the standard of living of every single citizen of the Caribbean. We are nearly 40 million people in the whole of the Caribbean. But because we are so divided, Europe and America can dictate terms to us that demean us in our desire for true liberation. So I'm here to say to us, Elijah Muhammad, my teacher, said to us that our unity is more powerful than a hydrogen or atomic weapon. And if you see the fear that is in America and Europe over Iran's possibility of having a nuclear weapon, fear in Pakistan because they have nuclear weapons, then what kind of fear would generate in those who dictate to us if we were unified, we could hold that off and hold them responsible responsible for repairing the damage that their colonialism and their enslavement of Africans in the Western Hemisphere has caused. And so when your Prime Minister was before the United Nations talking about reparations, well, it was Frederick Douglass who said that power concedes nothing without a demand, and you will never get what you demand unless you have the power to back up your demand. And the power will come from our unity, and then I tell you, the future of the Caribbean is great. I close that question with this from Elijah Muhammad. He said that in the 50s, the British wanted to unite all of their colonial possessions in the West Indies into a federation that would make it easier for them to control and to secure more economic strength. Mr. Um, Williams in Trinidad, Mr. Norman Manley in Jamaica, they wanted to make a federation. We were too immature. In Africa today, Gaddafi suffered, spent billions of dollars trying to promote what Kwame Nkrumah, under the guidance of Mosiah Gavi, brought, which was the United States of Africa, and all of his work to unite 53 countries in Africa, but we all want to be president. We all want to live in the mansion of our former colonial master. But if Africa united, nobody could dictate to Africa and rob Africa of her material strength. And it's the same in the Caribbean. We must seek not only economic unity, but political and spiritual unity as well. As we look at Obama, election is in November. How do you describe President Obama's presidency? First, one of the most beautiful men that I've had the joy in my life of seeing. His campaign for the presidency 
his articulation of his vision inspired not just black people, white people, Hispanic people in America. He inspired Gentiles and Jews and Muslims and he inspired the Caribbean. He inspired Central and South America. He inspired Africa. He inspired Europe because the whole world is looking at America and wondering who will change America's foreign policy and make it more humane to third world peoples. And that hope we had in Barack Obama and that beautiful young man, a constitutional lawyer, did something for us that no matter what he has not done, what he has done is to show little black children all over the world, particularly in America, that we don't have to be rappers. We don't have to be singers of song and givers of mirth to those who oppress us. We don't have to be dancers and football players and basketball players. We can be that, but we also can rule mighty nations. That's the good. But once he got into office, he surrounded himself with people from the world, um, from Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. And these business people, bankers, came in and inspired him to take out this, um, what do you call it, stimulus package of nearly 80, I'm sorry, uh, $700 billion, none of which came down to the masses of the people. It bailed out the banks and the banks are, were refusing to loan money to Main Street, but Wall Street got off like a fat cat. And now the people are angry with Obama. Obama with a sweetheart, yet he's bombing in Yemen, he's bombing in Somalia, he's bombing in Pakistan, he's bombing in Afghanistan. You see, they have turned a beautiful human being into one that assassinated Muammar Gaddafi. Gaddafi was no dictator. Gaddafi was a friend of the oppressed and suffering people of the world. Gaddafi set up a $70 billion African Development Bank. Gaddafi helped Africa with 300 million and the African nations 100 million to put up a 500 million dollar satellite that all the calls that we made to Africa would have to go through Europe. So at the end of a year, Europe benefited 500 million dollars from what we do. So Gaddafi helped put a satellite up we go direct now, that 500 million stays in Africa. He was going to set up a Caribbean Development Bank. And in St. Kitts was to be the headquarters of that bank. And he was going to put a billion dollars in that bank. When I was in St. Kitts, I asked the most honorable Denzel Douglas, is that true that you were going to have a bank here and he was going to put a billion dollars in that bank? He said, yes. I met Denzel Douglas and the, the Prime Minister Gonzalez from the Grenadines, Saint Vincent and the from St. Vincent and the Grenadines in CERT in Libya. He was proposing something to build the Caribbean so we would not have to take loans from the IMF the World Bank, the IDB, at exorbitant conditionalities and interest rates, that it would be almost interest-free. And so he's a dead man now, and the African Union that he was forging, a United States of Africa, now is uh, delayed, possibly destroyed for a moment. The Caribbean Initiative is gone, 
and now we're back enslaved to the powers of the West. And so Barack is, um, he might get elected, re-elected. They don't want him for another four years. The media has built up a hate campaign against that man, and now there are more guns being sold right now in advance of the election, more bullets being sold so that the gun manufacturers, their the request for guns is beyond their capacity right now to produce the weapons. People are going into gun shops, not buying little packages of bullets for target practice. They're buying cases of weapons because they feel that Barack Obama will destroy the Second Amendment of the Constitution and the citizens' right to bear arms. So my dear brother Barack is like a man, beautiful, but unfortunately, like Satan took Jesus up on the mountain and said, if you bow down to me, you could have this. But Jesus had the strength to say to Satan, get thee behind me. But my brother did not recognize Satan in the suggestions of those that he has put into office around him. So after being away from my instrument for 42 years, wow. I got me a, a wonderful a Jewish teacher, female, and as I was working on the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto when I gave up music, I went back and finished it and on my 60th birth anniversary, I played for the Muslim community with the symphony orchestra. They were astonished, weren't they? Yes, uh -huh. yes, yes. So now um, we have a documentary that was filmed by my son, Joshua. He just wanted to film how the, the album was being made. And so he did. And finally, when it was done, he said, Dad, you know, I think we have the seed of, of a documentary. And I think I had done a two or two day interview for the history makers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they asked me all about my life. And so some of my staff married uh, the history makers uh, interview with the music. And we have a documentary. Is it available for us to see? Yeah, not now. It is available. It will be. It will be. Okay. And we hope to, <clears throat> after getting all the clearances that we need to get, we're going to break it uh, on the public sometime in August. Okay, now listen, I'm taking numbers. I already have Don's information. I'm checking on you. Thank August you. is it. Yes, ma'am. The world needs to be exposed to you from so many different angles. We do. We have a younger generation that doesn't have the recollection of you as we do who are standing in this room today. We are all adults. The enemy knows the power of the word of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that's in my mouth. How did I become so strong, so powerful, that I, as a Muslim, could call my Christian family and they would respond to my call? What happened? It's because in 83, at the 20th anniversary of the March on Washington, I spoke on the mall. They only gave me one minute, but I took six. <laughs> and the Washington Post said that my talk in six minutes equaled the talk that Dr. King made 20 years before because he was not supposed to be the principal speaker, but after he spoke, he became the principal. 
20 years later, that happened with Louis Farrakhan. I went out, the thousands that were there, when I said, Assalamu alaikum, they said, Wa alaikum salam. So they already knew the greetings. So what did the enemy do? How did I become that popular? Because when I stood up for Reverend Jackson, when he wanted to be president of the United States, and he said uh, to a reporter off the record and used the term Jaime Town, mm -hmm. referring to the Jewish influence in the city of New York, that speech or that talk became public and the Jewish community rose up against Reverend Jackson who wanted to be president but he had a picture made with Yasser Arafat, the head of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And they thought that if Reverend Jackson would become a strong political figure, the shift would be in the black community away from being a, fa a, a favoring Israel to favoring the Palestinians. So they came down on Jesse. And when they came down on Jesse saying ruin Jesse ruin while we were saying run Jesse run Farrakhan was now a spokesperson for Reverend Jackson. And I never was taught mm -hmm. how to be a, 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 a what do you call it a, a surrogate speaker for my brother. You know, I, I'm not a politician. Mm -hmm. I don't care nothing about being politically correct. I just tell it like it is. And I got in trouble, and they said that I said Judaism was a gutter religion. That's what got me in trouble with the Jews. So they started picketing me in cities. When I went to California, 20,000 people showed up at the forum, and they were outside saying, who do you want? Farrakhan. How do you want him? Dead. Mm. They showed up at Madison Square Garden. But by this time, the minister was rocking the country because none of these white folks could defeat me in argument. So all the TV stations, go back and look at your brother being interviewed by the brightest white man. Oh, I've seen it. And I've none of it. them could handle me. So then they decided to kill me. Not physically at that time, but take him out of the public eye. That's why you haven't heard my voice, because they refuse now to interview me. Yes, sir. Yes. I was banned. Now in 2007, I had a 14 hour operation and surely they thought I was gonna die. Some of us thought that too. But I came out of that operation, I sent for Steve Harvey. I said, Steve, <laughs> I was 12 hours from going under the knife. I said, Steve, Savior's Day is next month and, and I want you to tell the people to meet me in Detroit for our Savior's Day convention. Steve looked at me, he said, what, this man about to go under the mm -hmm. knife and he ain't telling me about his operation, he telling me about the Savior's people. Day. The sure people. enough, the people. I was in Detroit. For Savior's Day. For Savior's Day. Amen. Tavis was there, mm -hmm. Cornell West was there, my cousin, um, Cicely Tyson was there. Everybody wanted to see, is the boy able? Is he, is he alive or what's going on? They saw that you still and had they it. Saw, oh Lord, still did had they it. see? Then Bashir of ABC came. Don Lemon of CNN came. It's the first time now I'm on television like that in, in years. Mm -hmm. And Don kept saying, I, are you sure? Come on, Farrakhan. Are you are you really sure you've been sick or you've been faking? Come on now. You sound so strong. You see, they were shocked. They sent them out to test me to see whether this is the same Farrakhan that was kicking their behind in these <laughs> interviews. Excuse my expression. <laughs> 
But they found out, oh, he's back. We got to leave him alone. Mm -hmm. Now, when I decided we're going to do the 20th anniversary of the March on Washington, but we're going to invite the indigenous people of America, the native people, to join us because they've got serious gripes. The Latino family to join us, they got serious rights. Women to join us. But we are at the cornerstone. I want to say this and then we can go on to the next question. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear uh, some of the presidential people saying, yes, 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 black lives matter, but all lives matter, which is true. Mm -hmm. But let me say something to all of you who want to change language, because you know how when you change language, you change a lot of direction when language changes. Black lives matter. And if you say all lives matter, no lives matter if black lives don't matter because all your lives came from the black man and the black woman. Let's get it clear and don't get it twisted. <laughs> all right, let's do that. So when we say the invitation is open to our indigenous brothers and sisters, we have to make that clear. Now, will we invite um, Indian? Will we invite Mexican? Are we opening it to all people? Yeah, I, I, I went to a conference in Washington. I was invited to speak. The Indian youth, there were approximately 1,800 of them gathered in Washington. They met with uh, President Obama and, and, and Mrs. Obama at the White House the day before. But I understand that some of the tribes that were present that were not recognized by the government, they were not allowed to be there. Mm. But when we spoke, those tribes, there were 200 or more tribes represented from 42 states. And when the minister spoke, well, I'll put it like this. When I finished, they all wanted to rush me. Their chiefs were sitting down in a, in a um, round table discussion but they said they heard the chief. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't Sitting Bull, but he was present. This wasn't Cochise, but he was present. This wasn't Geronimo, but he was present. And I challenged them, you are descendants of great warriors. What has happened to you that now you have 56.1 million acres of land worth 1.5 trillion with the mineral wealth that's under your foot and all that land is in trust to a government that you can't trust. Mm -hmm. We got to free the land. Mm -hmm. So now they're on board. 10, 10, 15. They got it. They'll be there. The Hispanic brothers and sisters, when they heard Brother Farrakhan's appeal, they said, we're down with it, Farrakhan. So now, I just talked to some of the mothers of the slain youth. We want every mother that has lost a child to gang violence and political wickedness or I'm, I'm sorry a police Brutality. wickedness mm -hmm. we want you present on 10 10 15 that's a sea of women not just the ones that you know about but we're after the ones who are in grief in every city and town in America where police have been killing black youth men and women, boys and girls. 
I want them at 10, 10, 15, because we have a case to put before a government that don't work for us. Pardon my passion. But I'm angry and I'm hurt that we have given all to America and America has not given nothing back to us equal to what we have given to America. We built this country. You built it on the sweat and the blood and the backs of slaves. We didn't come here looking for no opportunity. We were tricked and kidnapped out of here and deceived and betrayed by members of our own people. But we're here now. You got stolen goods that you stole. Don't act like you're innocent because you benefited from the slavery that was inflicted upon our people. So now, justice is what we seek. Justice is what we want. And justice is what we'll have or else. The or else. Could that be taken in so many different texts? Because I want to go back. Any way you want to take it. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Any way you want to take it. What about take it. what about taking it as the wrath of God? That's come the upon best you? or else. <laughs> okay. In fact, that's the only real, real or else. Because God said, "Be still and know that I am Amen. God." The battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. And vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So when we suffer like we've suffered, in this time, God is answering the cry of the poor and the weak for justice. Mm -hmm. And God is sufficient as the or else, but we got something that we got to do too. Well, can we get a prelude to what that or else? Of course we can. Let's talk. Come on. Now, you know, Dr. King is so misunderstood because the enemy didn't kill our brother because he had a dream. They killed our brother because he woke up from the dream and found the dream to be a nightmare. We have his direct words saying that. I read that. <laughs> and then on the last night of our brother's life at Mason Temple in Memphis, he started talking about land, how America gave millions of acres of lands to white immigrants from the Alsace region of France and Eastern Europe. This is after they promised us 40 acres and a mule. Congress passed the Homestead Act and white folk got land. So the immigrants came into America. They got land, they got money, they got uh, loans, they got the instruments to build on that land, farming. They did it for white folk. And Dr. King, may God always be pleased with that man. He said, some of you say, that we should pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Mm -hmm. He's knocking on white folks' doors now. And he says to America, that's like telling a man that been in prison unjustly and you let him out, but you give him nothing. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even have enough money to make a meal for himself. Then you tell us, pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and we don't even have shoes. So this is mockery. This is what Dr. King is saying. This is the night before he's dying. He knows that he's in the valley of the shadow of death. He feels it. And he's talking to us on that night. Mm.
See, when you walk in the shoes of your brother and you know what your brother went through for a people, when Dr. King made that speech about the war in Vietnam and you're trying to tell me that nonviolence is what I should preach to my people and yet you p p prosecuting a war, killing people in Vietnam. So filled with hatred, America develops chemicals that you could drop on the jungle and defoliate the jungle. And you put our soldiers in harm's way, and when they came back victimized by there was nobody to look out for the soldier. You are wicked government. You lied in the Tonkin Gulf situation to get us into the war in Vietnam. 500,000 American soldiers, 56,000 dead, and the majority of the dead were the black and the brown and the poor white. And you did it again by lying and saying that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction when you told us that lie and organized our soldiers to go and die in Iraq and kill in Iraq and die in Afghanistan and kill in Afghanistan on the basis of a lie. The president was a liar. The vice president lied. Condoleezza Rice lied. The whole government lied. And we died on the basis of a lie. We should have them in, a, in court as a criminals. Did I say it wrong? No. No. These are criminals that should be prosecuted for crimes against humanity to send us into war on the basis of a lie. And while I'm on that subject, criminals. <clears throat> I'm coming back to Dr. King, but President Obama trying to keep us out of war. You say he didn't get a good enough deal because white folk with your white supremacy, superiority attitude, you want everybody to bow down to you like you are the God. But the Iranians did not bow. They had something to say and you had to compromise in order for there to be a deal. And if they don't manufacture an atomic weapon, you've won. But you are angry because you had to give up something to get something? Is what you want war? You want Israel now, her way, to be prevalent, to prevail? Well, go ahead. Barack is trying to save you. But if you want war, you got it. If you want the last war, the war of Armageddon, that's what you're leading up to America and you won't win. You can't win a war anymore. Your day of winning war is over. You're finished as a nation. I'm here as a warner from my teacher, Elijah Muhammad. That's why it's justice or else. So Dr. King said, he said, you know, at that time in 68, we made $38 billion in a year. He said, there's only nine countries on this earth that have more money to spend than us. We are rich as an aggregate. We are poor individually. So what I'm recommending, Dr. King said, is that when we are in pain, the garbage workers didn't get no justice. The mayor at that time, Mayor Loeb, was really hard. So Dr. King said, let's redistribute the pain. Why should we be in pain and those who inflict pain on us don't get some of that pain? So he said, let's redistribute the pain. This is the last night of that man's life. And he said, uh, 
So I'm asking you tonight, don't buy Coca-Cola in Memphis. I'm asking you tonight, don't buy seal test milk and wonder bread. And then he said, and what's that other bread, Jesse? And Reverend Jackson said, it's heart's bread. He said, don't, don't buy heart's bread. And then let's go down to the bank in the morning and take our money out of the white man's bank and put it in a black bank. Let's have insurance with a black insurance company. This is Dr. King talking. Let's distribute the pain. And I read recently, I didn't know this, but I'm asking people, we got to redistribute the pain. And after the march or the gathering on 10, 10, 15, the month after, on the day after Thanksgiving, what's that day called? Black Friday. The la Black Friday. Oh. <laughs> well, Black Friday should be a Black Friday then. Mm -hmm. We don't go and spend our money. Mm -hmm. Distribute the pain. Mm -hmm. They build their whole year on our consumer spending during the so-called Christmas. Here you got uh, Jesus, the great, oh my goodness, righteous man. And you kick him to the curb with Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. A and mythical white man. And run up credit card What you say? For our families, yes. See, you don't have it? So you want to show white people that you're going to give something to your children? You know why Santa keeps saying, ho, ho, ho? <laughs> the businessman is saying, ha, ha, ha? Because <laughs> Santa said, ho, ho, ho? And like Malcolm said, you've been took. You've been had. You've been bamboozled. So let's... Let's do something to redistribute the pain. And so I'm asking that we should boycott Christmas. All black people together. That's right. Yes, don't spend no money to the liquor store in the name of Jesus. Jesus turned water into wine, but you never saw the disciples drunk. So you make white folk rich with your silliness, drunken in his name. Did you know that Constantine, when he became Caesar, he was a pagan, he was a heathen. Then he accepted Christianity and he wanted to marry the worship of the sun to the belief that Jesus was the Son of God. Mm -hmm. So what he did, as the Bible will teach you if you go read it, you cut down a tree out of the forest, you bring it in your house, you nail it down, you deck the tree with, with silver, silver and, and gold. gold. This is a heathen practice. The, the wreath that is in the, the window represents the sun. You make the uh, electric company rich, putting little candles all in your window. You think you're honoring Jesus, but you're honoring the sun god. Jesus never asked you to do that. You are doing something that make you poor, the white man rich, and it dishonors Jesus the way you handle that man on his so-called birthday. Let's do something different this year. Let's come back to our homes and have dinner. Bring the family around. Jesus was the king of love. Why don't you show love to those that you are having a problem with? Since you love to forgive everybody, <laughs> you forgive that devil down there in Charleston that came to a prayer meeting like he wanted to pray, P-R-A-Y, but he came to make us a P-I-E-Y, a prey, and then he took out his gun and shot 
our innocent people down and then we before we even bury our dead we say <coughs> we forgive how often have you forgiven your own brother your own sister angry with your mother because she said something angry with your auntie angry with your cousin angry with your neighbor angry with your fellow worshiper from the same church that you go to in the same organization that you are part of and you can't forgive one another but you can forgive the white man for the evil that he has done to us for 450 years let's take it home you're saying just have a conversation. Just have a conversation around the table about the love that Christ brought into this world. Mm -hmm. Look at this command, the last one that he gave. Love ye one another, mm -hmm. even as I have loved you. Why don't we just declare we're going to practice that this Christmas. We're not going to spend our money. We're not going to dishonor Jesus with drunken revelry. We're going to be sober and grateful for the presence of such a one in the world and now Jesus. make him present in our lives. And I guarantee you the day after Christmas walk out in the hood and there'll be a holy different attitude among the people. We need to stop the bloodshed in our community. We need to practice nonviolence in our community. Then we can go to the white man in Washington and say, we're not taking this no more. When we die, be careful. Because in our holy book, the Quran, and in the Bible, a life for a life. A it's tooth what for it a says. tooth. Eye for an eye. An eye for an eye. And some of our Christian families say, and that would be a blind and toothless people. Yeah, but the one that made you blind would also be blind. Mm -hmm. The one that made you toothless would also be toothless. And when he can't see no more like you can't see no more, then we can sit down at a table and talk about a way forward. But as long as you dying, and they are not dying, then they'll continue to kill us. I say we've had enough. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to Washington 10, 10, 15, justice or else. And I am telling you, God is on scene today. Can't you see him punishing America? Fire on the West Coast, drought on the West Coast, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, hail, unusual rain, unusual snow. You have not seen anything yet. God is turning the forces of nature against you. Wake up, black man and woman. It's time for us to unite. Wake up, native indigenous people. It's time to unite. Stop talking tribe and start talking nation. Stop talking Christian, Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Catholic, Church of God in Christ. Those are denomination. Jesus was none of that. Why would you want to be what Jesus never said he was? You're a, a unique voice in America uh, behind an organized group, a disciplined group, a group that has a spiritual aim and uh, has been changing and growing also. One of those major happenings was the Million Man March that occurred 20 years ago. And um, it is a, a little bit scary, I think, for the system. Uh, I think the way the media approaches, the mainstream media uh, sort of teeters uh, and try to, but doesn't touch it. And more and more, and every year we see that it's more and more untouchable in the mainstream media. What is it in the Million Man March that is scary for the mainstream media? Your own words this past time? And what do you think is in the future of your movement in general? When you are an oppressor, 
One of the things that you fear is the unity of the oppressed. Because once the oppressed find the path to unity and have had enough of oppression, their unity and their desire to be free, justified, and equal brings them against that tyrannical force. And the history and nature teaches us that there is no power that can stop a human being who wants to be free. And so when they see our unity, they see the end of their rule over us, and that's what terrifies them. And that is what terrifies Satan. If you remember in the Quran, Satan and Allah were having a conversation. And that's very interesting that God and Satan should dialogue. And Satan says to Allah, respite me till the day when they are raised. Raised how? The masses of the people are in a state of slumber or death or sleep. And so Satan can rule the people as long as they are in a state of death or sleep. So the Satan is saying to God, respite me, delay my doom until the day when they are raised in consciousness. The word in consciousness is not there, but the people that are raised in consciousness are not going back to sleep. That means Satan's time is absolutely up. And so Satan says to God, because you have caused me to remain disappointed and judged me as erring, I am going to lie in wait for them in your straight path. And I'll come after them from before them, from behind them, from their left side and from their right side. And I will make all of them deviate. And Allah says, whosoever follows you, I will certainly fill hell with you all. Now just look at our religion, Islam. Look at Christianity. Look at Judaism. Look at Buddhism. Look at anyone that says, my religion is from God. And study their actions. Satan has already taken control of Islam. Satan is in control of Christianity, of Buddhism. So right in our religion, the enemy has come, and now look at the division of Muslims. The Shia on one side, the Sunni on the other. Nations gathering on the Sunni side and nations gathering on the Shia side. And what is between the two now is a toxicity of language and actions that produce hatred between two brothers. So all it needs now is for the enemy to start a, a match or a little conflagration and it could lead to a civil war, a religious war between Muslims and thus Satan wins. But Allah says in the Quran, they plan and Allah plans and he is the best of planners. But I humbly say to this beautiful audience, Allah says in the Quran, hold fast to the rope of Allah and be not divided. We're not listening to Allah. It says, and you were on the brink of a pit of fire. And Allah saved you from it. He united your hearts and you became brethren while before you were enemies. And that is the condition of our Islam today. That's the condition of Christianity. That's the condition of religion. 
And that says Satan has fulfilled his word. And Allah says in another part of the Quran, you will only get, you will not get my purified ones. And those of us whom Allah purifies from the dross of the fall of Islam, the fall of this world into evil and decadence, we might make it out of this. A great war is coming, and if we can't find the path of unity, this Middle East is going to go up in the fire of death and destruction because this area is the trigger for the great war that the prophets predicted that every nation would be involved with. So I pray that Islam and Christianity and Judaism and all of the religions that are at, uh, in, become enemies of each other, I pray that we will stop, put the guns down and sit down like followers of the prophet and bring his sunnah and this Quran in the center and let's reason together and find the path to peace. Um, you know, America has, because you, you've been around, mashallah, for a good time, you've seen America change. America in 1975 was not the same America it is today. Values have uh, degraded to the point that somebody of your generation, um, somebody of my generation who has witnessed things, uh, are surprised at how quickly um, values collapsed in America beginning in the 80s onwards. How foreign do you feel yourself in your own country? Well, we have to understand that we're living at the time of the fall of America. She's losing her power, her prestige, her influence. She's in a state of moral and intellectual decline. The whole idea of white supremacy has run its course and it is now on its deathbed. Well, when you see a civilization going down, it's like a major ship <laughs> that is sinking. And you don't want to get caught in the pull of a sinking ship. So it's time now, as the Bible says, and the Quran, it, I think the Quran says, Set your face for religion, being upright, the nature made by Allah in which he has created man. Before they come from Allah, that which cannot be averted, and on that day they shall be separated. So the righteous are going to have to be separated from those that love wickedness. And so... I, I'm, at, I'm at home among the filth of America because my people are there in the mud. The other day, they took me to the helicopter to have a beautiful ride over to where the uh, president was speaking. And as I was going toward the helicopter, I stepped in some mud. And um, as I stepped up on the uh, uh, helicopter, my feet slipped a little on the uh, stairs going up because the bottom of my shoe was completely muddy. And as I sat there waiting for the helicopter to take off, the brothers took my shoes off and began to clean the mud. Well, my people... The black people of America are in the mud of civilization. My job from Elijah Muhammad is to transform their lives 
So I can't transform their lives from a television studio or um, from a distance. I've got to get my foot in the mud to get my people up out of the mud. And so I'm, I'm at home in America in spite of her filth because our people are there, our mission is there, and we cannot leave them in their condition. We have to work with them until they, like we, experience the transformative power of Islam. <clears throat> Minister Farhan, the Afro-American minority in America is a powerful minority because they're the only ones that when they resist, somehow the cities end up in martial law. And suddenly you see Ferguson with tanks, with armored vehicles, with men uh, armed to the hilt, uh, something that we, we did not witness two, three decades ago. How is it, how, and we remember Los Angeles, let's, let's say 25 years ago, but as we are proceeding in time, this is becoming more and more serious. The white supremacist is becoming more and more ruthless. It's not learning its lessons. It kills uh, easily. And the resistance is there, and the martial law is instituted I remember we, we've been having uh, New Horizon conferences in Iran in which different groups of Americans have come and visited our country, many of them patriotic Americans, and the last group was the Afro-Americans. Every group that came to Iran and went back was harassed at the border when they entered America. Sometimes they were detained from three hours up to 18 hours. Dr. Finkelstein was detained for 18 hours. But when the Afro-Americans went back, they didn't even ask him a question, as if something was different here. Now, I, as somebody who witnessed that conference, and I've been witnessing the news, uh, I have a question I would like to ask Minister Farah Khan. What, what is it that uh, they're so careful? What is it that they're watching out for? Because I know they're watching it. Uh, it's a concentrated decision that was made. We had 25 guests who went back, and this time, for the first time, no one was detained at customs. They weren't even asked a deviant question. Or where were you, what were you doing there? Well, um, Pharaoh, when the children of Israel were in Egypt under his tyrannical rule, Pharaoh feared a couple of things that he called a conspiracy to um, get rid of this that he feared. The words that are in the Bible read like this, Pharaoh speaking, come, let us in words take counsel together. Here's a problem. The children of Israel are multiplying. So we have to deal wisely with them lest they multiply and join on to an enemy of ours and come against us. The fear of the government of the United States of America with blacks like Paul Robeson leaving America and being accepted in Russia. He learned to speak Russian. He was a great celebrity in Russia. When he got back to America, he was vilified. His passport was taken. W.E.B. Du Bois, his passport was taken. Martin Luther King even was censured uh, after he came back to the United States from Africa. Well, now this military militarization of the police is because America expects something. 
I was very concerned when a black man was made president and the hatred of many white supremacists against Barack, I thought, oh my, they must think that he's going to be assassinated. And as a hundred cities were caught on fire when Martin Luther King was assassinated, if they ever assassinated Barack Obama, it would create revolution. So I watched, and so far it looks like he might get out in this next 10 months. But here's the dynamic. Since um, uh, Barack Obama became president, you have over a thousand militias in America made up of white people. White people with heavy armament that are angry with their government. And you know right now the, the Congress is at 11% of people satisfied with it. That means 89% are dissatisfied with Congress. The president's rate probably in the 40s and the Supreme Court down. The people are dissatisfied and white people are not like us. We get angry and we might march a little, raise a little hell and then go back to sleep. So they don't worry too much about us. But white people coming over here, you went to Iran for what? You can't tell them that they're just innocent people coming to look at a revolutionary society and that society has not affected them positively. So all of these militias that are well armed, black people have the right as citizens to buy a weapon, but how many black people legally have access to weapons? The weapons that are in the black community are illegal among the youth and they don't really know how to shoot. They can't go to the gun range and learn because they're not legally um, carrying weapons. But white people, you got over 315 or 20 million Americans and you got almost 350 million guns among the American people. So the American people are armed to the teeth, angry, upset. So here's the Bible prophecy. Since you love talking to white people in America, since you love the shedding of blood, I am going to give you your own blood to drink and you will be drunk with your own blood as with sweet wine. Now you go back and look at Waco, Texas and, and look at recently in Washington armed revolt among whites. They're not playing. And so they are ready to shoot and the government will be forced to shoot them. And I sit back and I look at Mrs. Clinton and the group saying to Barack, if we don't stop Gaddafi, he's gonna slaughter his own people as if you care. But you wanted Gaddafi out of the way. Oh, he killed his own people. You started a civil war in Syria. Anytime there's a civil war, there's the killing of your own people. America's meddling in the Middle East, meddling in the affairs of other nations, creates a civil war condition. Well, she never thought that that was going to come home to her. So remember the principle of justice. You can't sow corn and reap potatoes. You get back what you put in. 
America has done evil, not the American people. I'm talking about wicked policies of a government run amok. And now those chickens, as Brother Malcolm said once, are coming home to roost. So America, get your guns ready. Because you don't have to deal with us. Because we don't have any weapons. You're going to have to deal with your angry citizens. And then somebody else is going to say, look at America. She's killing her own people. <laughs> so, oh, it's, you know, justice is a beautiful thing. You know, when, when you look at the principle, what is just for the oppressed is not the same justice for the oppressor. The oppressor must reap what they have sown and the oppressed get mercy from God and deliverance from their condition. Sorry for that run-on sentence, brother. But <clears throat> so you think that um, we are approaching a moment in history that some believe is very different than previous moments. Uh, it's a sort of a climax. I mean, when you even look at the prospects of an election, uh, you have characters that you never had seen before that almost looked like caricatures uh, compared to what you had three decades ago, four decades ago. They don't even look like politicians anymore. Um, what signs are there? I mean, what, what are these signs and what, how are you alarmed? about what you have to do as a leader of the Afro-American community to be able to survive this tumult? Separation is the best answer. America is on a downward trajectory. And some of those that I've been watching who want to be president will hasten the trajectory downward when you listen to their speeches, their so-called desires for America. But the black man, he has to taste some of the punishment because every great leader that we've ever had, we never followed them well. We cheered them, and when they were gone, we went right back to sleep. So we're headed for a divine whipping, but America is headed for divine destruction. So when I go back, God willing, I have to point out to America her only way out of what's come upon her and then it's up to her to do with me what she pleases and to do with what we say. But the calamities are increasing daily. Allah is whipping America with the forces of nature. And America can escape it. But there's something America has to do. And it starts with the word repentance. And if America will not repent, and I doubt that she will because she's so arrogant over her perceived power. She thinks she can make the whole world afraid of her. And most of the world is afraid of her. But today, ask North Korea, are you afraid of America? Ask China. How about you? Ask ISIL. America's talking about there's just 30,000 of them and you got to get the whole Western world together to fight ISIL. What happened to you? You can't go it alone no more. Suck your brothers in to your demise. Yes, we're in a a great and a dreadful day right now. 
America can escape it. It's a very narrow window, but we will present to America that narrow window and see what she will do. She's at the end. But what I want to say to you, you started off by declaring that we believe that God is a man who taught uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, those of us here in this room, and we believe it in whoever else who's listening to us. But there are people who use the term, which in my opinion should have been eliminated by now. This is a cartoonish religion. This is a way of life that we've submitted to. Those that dispute after knowledge has come to them. We declared that God was a man. We came into the nation of Islam with that belief. Are you concerned with the, well, I guess, the struggling Muslims who are under chastisement, but they use that to critique the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? I can go along with Minister Farrakhan, but he keep bringing back that God is a man. I just can't take this. This is some of the, the people that you even taught in New York who have become imams. Now, well, let me, let me help with this. Please. You know, every man is finite. Mm -hmm. None of us in this flesh body can live forever. Right. So Allah created us in pairs and gave man a sperm and gave woman an egg so that man can continue mm -hmm. uninterrupted That's from it. the beginning to infinity. Yes. So when we say that a man appeared Teak. that was born February 26, 1877, certainly that man did not create the, the heavens. heavens and the earth. Right. He didn't create himself. He's a product That's of right. the originator. That's right. But he came to us. Who can deny that a master came? Who can deny that a man came among us and gave us wisdom to reverse what white folk had done to destroy us totally and completely? Prophet Muhammad was up in a cave. God didn't come to him personally. <laughs> he came to him through a man. Cage. Jibreel came and said, read. He never said he was the messenger of Jibreel. He said he was the messenger of Allah because Jibreel was the one that brought the message. Right. Master Farid Muhammad brought us a message that saved our lives and delivered us and put us in the vanguard position uh -huh. over Muslims all over the world. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. You are not in no vanguard position. You are dying every day from your rebellion against Allah and his prophet Muhammad. And you have taken this Quran and put it behind your back. You got a hell of a nerve <laughs> telling us that our man that came didn't come to us, that that was not God visiting us. Don't you know, beloved, if I come to your house and bring you wisdom that brings you out of your condition, you have a right to say God visited me. Not that I am God, but I am bringing you a message that delivered you, and that message is from God. We're going to have to make a decision. I'm sorry, now, I have to but, 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 now. Let me tell you something. We, oh, are you leaving me? No. I oh, okay. Stay a few oh. more minutes. <laughs> okay, let me tell you. We're going to have to make a decision. But let me just say, brothers and sisters, go ahead and get your final call. Because uh, the minister is warning the rap stars, uh, they're being targeted. And, you know, every time they, he, they, he gets a friend, they want to stop uh, these young people. They have a lot of money sometimes, and they want to help. And they don't want nothing coming to uh, the minister financially. And, and let me say this before we go, because I don't think people really understand this. 
You know, we can be Negroes. We see someone uh, living well or look good. We think we giving them all the, the money. But I, I just think people need to know that you don't get honorariums from churches. Nobody's paying your way. You pay your staff's way, and you go to these places to preach and, and teach. Now, the 20-year anniversary is going to need some, some help. You know, and this, and we say and I can't pay that. <laughs> yeah, you can pay for a few, but we can't take the world. I certainly don't mind paying uh, my way here and there. I like to get around out in America and see this beautiful place. I, I really thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yes, because all of us have a share. Yeah, we put up the money, most of it, yeah. for the Million Man March. Yes, you did. Michael Jackson gave a hundred thousand dollar donation. And they wanted to punish him. I asked him to sing. <laughs> I'm looking at the man in the mirror. Yeah. But his advisors didn't want him to come. Yeah. Because Farrakhan was yeah. carrying the day. Johnny Cochran mm -hmm. showed up on NBC. And, CNN. and Tim Russett mm -hmm. made him think that I call Jews bloodsuckers. They didn't tell the whole truth. Mm. I said, anybody that comes in our community, takes money out of our community, and leaves nothing in our community is a blood sucker of our community. I don't care what your color is. Yes. You have to give back to that which gives to you. Our, our uh, not Chinese, our Korean uh, brothers and sisters, they come, they give you your nails, they give you your hair, and they take that money. They don't put it in a black bank in the black community. They take it back to where they live. That's a blood sucker. You got Arabs that come in there on every corner. Those are my Palestinian family, my brothers in Islam, but they will sell pork to my people, alcohol even drug paraphernalia, and then mistreat and take advantage of our women. That is not a brotherly thing to do. You make my job harder. That's a blood sucker of the poor. Take it or let it alone. Uh, brothers and sisters, I know we're going to make a transition just for a moment, and uh, we're going to have a drink of water, and uh, we'll uh, be back soon, I hope. So, yeah. I, I would say this. Every March that our people have had, they always had Jewish philanthropists and Gentiles mm -hmm. pay the way. So when people pay the way, they can tell you who can speak and who can't, who can come and who can't. The last two big celebrations that came that our president was the speaker. Not one time did they offer to invite me. Mm -hmm. None of our leaders could even stand up and say, well, wait a minute. But, yeah. I mean, Farrakhan is one of us. What have I done to you all? And you know that the people listen to me. But you won't invite me because those who pay for you to speak tell you who can speak. And that's why you're not qualified to lead our people another day because you're bought and paid for by the enemy of our people. You should be ashamed of yourself. Yes, and some of you are preachers. Right talking about resist the devil and he will flee from you. Why don't you try it and see if it will happen? You don't know who the devil is after he has been giving you hell for 450 years? Resist him. Don't bow down and back down because you're scared to death of your own shadow when the enemy shows up. You are not God's people. You're not a good Christian. You're a good punk. Now You should be ashamed of yourself. Now, brother, Stand up like a man. 
Brother Minister, let me ask you this, because you're not just speaking off the cuff. A uh, very popular man that we've known, I think Mayor Johnny Ford, spoke to you about a 50-year anniversary, and, they, and he raised your name and That's wanted correct. the people to invite you. And we all know Johnny. We liked him. And he was bold enough to do it, and they, they thought he was crazy. They didn't say he was crazy, but they treated him like he said nothing. Yeah, ignore Mark Morial said, uh, Urban League according guy. to uh, Doc, uh, Johnny Ford, he said, thank you for your passion. You all know what you're doing. You know that because President Obama was speaking, you didn't want me there. In Selma, Alabama, you that put it on, you never gave me a formal invitation. I got word of mouth through this. Uh, snake vine, <laughs> I'm sorry, the grape vine, come on, yeah. that you wanted the minister to come. You know you don't want me when you know I'm going to tell the truth. Mm. So it's all right. But this is a new day now. Are you going to invite? Hell no. Oh. <laughs> 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 no, so you go ahead, buddy. I'm invited on that. <laughs> okay, but now let me say this though. This is this is something that needs to be said though. All these so-called leaders and uh, who've been speaking for our people now they're hearing rumblings because everybody got to be excited now for a man who have not been within the mainstream press. But this word is heating up, man. That these people are listening to Farrakhan from all over now, West Coast, East Coast. The South, I mean, you know, you're crisscrossing America. Now, remember, it took a couple of years on the Million Man March. But now, how long have you been pushing this 20th year anniversary? I mean, it, it hadn't been that long. No, but social media is a great um, tool. Mm -hmm. It created revolution in Egypt. Yeah. And it creates revolution, and it's saying that the uh, I would say the, the paid for media, mm -hmm. the controlled media is losing its power. They're not what they used to be. Look at what they're doing now. Here's Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, a, joke. <laughs> a joke. Donald Trump, but he's getting support. Yes. Because all the rest of these people when they say, I want to be president, they're telling you they're throwing their hat in the ring with no money. So they got to go to people with money yeah. to back them. And at the same time that they ask for money, here come the string of a puppet maker and a puppeteer. You understand uh, what yes. I'm saying? Yes, sir. You, you buy you get bought for favor. But Donald Trump said, oh, I got over $10 billion. Yeah. I don't need nobody's money. Don't you know the American people know that that's a man? Whether he sound crazy to you or not, he's his own crazy man. Yeah. And he buying what he want. Burn. And, and you can trust him because he's not bought or paid for. That's who you getting. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. See? Obama, when he came, he pulled a coup if he walked behind it. Because when social media took Obama and Obama began to ask for $5, $10, $20, $50, he raised a billion dollars yeah. almost by himself. Yeah. He didn't need to bow down to none of the money people because the people were with him. So when you know you got the people with you, what the hell are you bowing down for? The people are the power, not that that says it's the power. Mm -hmm. And when I have the people with me, you will see I will give orders mm -hmm. and they will carry it out because I have that kind of support. Now, what was your mm -hmm. thoughts when um, Obama, of course, was used at the end, uh, Hillary Clinton pressed him and pushed him to the brink of uh, denouncing you? 
Well, her day is come. She pushed him. And if he didn't denounce me, he wouldn't be president today. Right. Because Mr. Friedman of the Washington Post or the New York Times, all of them, they were watching to see. Because I was the litmus test. If you can condemn Farrakhan, you'll have our vote. Mm. It was the same in New York City with uh, David Dinkins. Yeah, yeah. Dinkins wanted the Jewish support. So he went on TV saying every evil thing he could say about Farrakhan. If I had come into New York, I could have told that man a new behind. Mm. But I knew that our people wanted a black mayor in Washington, I mean in New, New York. York, so I left him alone. Yeah. And I came to New York later. He was running for his second term, and we were about to hire Yankee Stadium. And the new, the Negro leaders came to me and said, Farrakhan, if you would postpone your coming now, we're trying to get Dave Dinkins reelected. If you would postpone your coming, we will back you in your next engagement here. Mm -hmm. I said, really? I said, don't you know if I filled up by the grace of God, Yankee Stadium, you could come and talk to the people about Mr. <laughs> Dinkins and put all 60,000 of them behind them. They didn't care what I said. Okay. So wait a minute. Okay, I okay. told them, all right, brother, I won't come. And when I decided to come, the only one of those New York leaders that showed up was the Reverend Al Sharpton. Let me tell you, Sharpton, you may not like him, but I'm telling you, that's a man, whenever he's given me his word, he carried that word out. He's not a bad man. He's the door to Obama. Right. Yeah. And those of you who are upset because he's the doorman, <laughs> you don't want to go in. <laughs> Respect the doorman and he'll let you in. <laughs> but today, I have to say this. Yeah. All of you know what you've done to me. Mm -hmm. All of you know what you say behind the door to your followers concerning me. Mm. But it's my day now. Right. Mm. Be careful, because the very people that I'm teaching that follow you will turn on you because they know that I'm a sincere man who is unafraid of this enemy. I will speak the truth and die on it to see our people free. What about you? Yes. So you... Um so if you want to help me yeah. and give me, now I'm not the freedom to speak, because <laughs> I'll take that regardless. Mm. But I want you to help me put on a day where it's bigger than the day, but it, was, it is about the day before, the day of, but most importantly, the day after. I'm going to put a program before Congress. I'll talk about that later on. It's a program to deliver us from the tyranny of our open enemy. I'm not begging nobody to back me in that. I already have the backing of God and his Christ. You will soon see. I'm not a madman, and I'm not crazy. Try me and see. So if you want to help me, a man that won't punk out on you, that can't be bought, the Jewish people that don't like me, you don't have a ladder tall enough to get you up to the heaven where my blessings come from. So you're going to have to sit on the sideline and watch. And if you make the mistake, I'm warning you and the government, 
If you make a mistake, thinking that you can do to me and us as you've done to others, I welcome you. Come on with it. And I'll show you the power of a God that will take you out and take your country from you and give it to whom he pleases. And you in the black community that are killing our people, I'm warning you in the name of the God and his messenger Messiah that have raised me and taught me that you are headed for the chastisement of Allah. If you don't stop killing each other, then God is going to send the white man to kill you and inspire it. He's already inspired, you know. He don't need much to kill a black man. So if you keep this foolishness up, God is going to turn him loose as it's written in the scripture. Those who would not obey Moses and Aaron, they were bitten by fiery serpents. It only mean angry white people. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you. But if you're a real man and a real woman, this life is what God gave us. That's all we got. And if you are not willing to fight to preserve and protect and maintain this life and stop anyone who's trying to take it from you, even if you have to take their lives in the process, then you're not even worthy to have the life that you have. This is a gift from God, and we are right to defend it with our lives. So when we die, why should they go and eat a burger? Mm. Yeah. They should die too. Mm. So the yeah, funeral is on both sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We cry, you cry. Yeah, yeah. We die, you die. Yeah, yeah. Then in the end, We'll sit down at a common table like intelligent people who are tired of burying our loved ones mm -hmm. and we'll say, can, can we make a deal? <laughs> yeah. It's a time for a divorce now right. mm -hmm. and a settlement. We can't get along with you and there ain't no BS that you're going to hand us to make us believe that in the next generation, this is going to be a better people. The hell they will. We are 50 years from Dr. King and they are worse today than they were when Doc was here. They hit us with cattle prods and billy sticks and whatnot. But today they're killing us outright. No, they're worse today than they were. So we got to protect this life. We're not aggressive. We don't bother nobody. Don't ever be the aggressor. But if anybody come, tell them like they tell you. When I saw you coming, I saw the history of what you do. And I became afraid for my life. And I stood my ground. And if you lose yours, I'm sorry. I was just afraid. Ain't that what you say when you kill us? A big burly Negro, Michael Brown Jr., you was afraid of him when you and he were the same size? But your messed up vision is that you saw a big burly young black man. And that's why you shoot us eight, nine, ten times when one time, if you're trained right, would be enough. But you're a murderer. But I'm here to tell you, those who live by the sword will die by the same sword.